Okay, here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and in 1 Samuel 17. Uh, David has an astonishing uh, victory with complete confidence, filled with the Holy Spirit, defeats Goliath. At the beginning of chapter 18, uh, uh, David meets Jonathan, Saul's son, and uh, the two of their hearts knit together in a, in a wonderful wonderful way but as uh, the the people um, as as David experiences more and more victories for the children of Israel for the nation of Israel the the people's hearts hearts begin to uh, turn to him and and are just uh, very grateful for him Philistines had been oppressing them imagine just being released from the oppression um, it never mentions they were favoring him over Saul, but uh, Saul, by this point, uh, he's, he's not in a good way, and he begins, to, uh, he, he begins to plot and scheme um, against uh, David, and uh, that's where we begin in chapter 19. Chapter 19, verse 1 says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, de- delighted greatly uh, in David. A- and so at this point, uh, you know, S- Saul is, uh, he's just got a seared conscience. Y- y- the Lord, throughout the Bible, we read of these times where the Lord gives someone over to their own sin. Uh, the Bible says uh, I- in a verse that should be a warning to all of us, uh, I believe it's in Genesis chapter 6, where God says, I will not strive with man forever. And uh, if you're in habitual sin, habitual rebellion against God, and you are being licentious in the fact you're taking, you're taking license to sin, and you think you have the light, the grace gives you the license to sin, the Bible says God's not going to strive with you forever. And so be careful for that because he, 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 he is given at this point Saul over to his own selfish ambition. And it should be a warning to us all, you know, in just a couple chapters um, earlier in, in, in chapter uh, 15 when uh, Saul had begun his de- decline uh, into rebellion, Samuel had said to him, he said, Saul, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? M- meaning, you know, when you were small in your own eyes, it was then when you were serving the Lord as king of Israel. But now, by chapter 19, Basically, the kingdom has been, it, he's operating the kingdom really for his own pleasure. You know, uh, some countries today around the world, I think of North Korea, there's some African countries, uh, they exist solely for the pleasure uh, of their ruler. But this was the rule of the day at this time, at the time of Israel, at the time of the first, uh, the events in, in 1 Samuel uh, 19 here. Uh, it, it, but but Israel had been different. Uh, in fact, we're g- g- it's an astonishing thing because at the time the Pharaoh in Egypt was the country existed for his pleasure, and he was called a god. M- many of the kings at that time deified themselves, uh, calling themselves god, and the, and the entire kingdom existed for their pleasure. Not so the people of God and the people uh, uh, of God. This is one of the astonishing things about. Uh, about reading the Bible is the tremendous tr- contrast uh, between the the Bible and and every uh, every other country that existed at that time that the kings were supposed to be shepherds of their people. It was precisely the opposite. David was called later on the shepherd of Israel, and um, but Saul now he's like any other king, operating the kingdom um, for his own uh, pleasure. So verse 2 said, so, so, so he's like, at this point, he wants to kill David. 
who's doing nothing but serving the kingdom, serving the people, but he's jealous of them. Verse 2 says, So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand before my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Thus Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. He tried to reason uh, with his father, it says in verse 4. But as we mentioned last week, uh, the proverb in the proverb says, Anger is cruel, fury is overwhelming, but who can stand before jealousy? There's no reasoning with a jealous person. I, I've been in counseling before, marriage counseling, where I, Steffi and I, have, have tried to reason with a jealous spouse. It just, it, 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 there is no reason. It is a spiritual stronghold that must be broken. And he tries to reason with, his, Jonathan does with his father, um, speaking well of David, verse 4. Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. Verse 5, for he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine. And the Lord brought about a great deliverance for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. So he's reminding, look, you rejoiced, Dad, when Goliath hit the ground and you saw his head cut off by David. Do you not remember that? Nothing's changed. David's the same person. He's a loyal soldier. Why then, he continues with his father, will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Verse 6, so Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. So we're going to be seeing Saul uh, make these kind of um, owes more in the future. They mean very little. Um, they're very short-lived. You know, we cannot do um, in the natural what, what, what is only accomplished in the supernatural. And at this point, the natural man in him is just pure jealousy. You can make all the commitments in the world. Uh, you can make all the commitments in the world, whatever your issue is, whether jealousy, envy, anger, or anything else. There's got to be a suit. You can't, you can't do in the natural what can only be done in the supernatural. And so um, this oath means almost nothing. Verse 7, Jonathan called David. Uh, J Jonathan is practicing love, believing all things here, but uh, uh, unfortunately, there's another verse in the Bible called, you know, we're also told in the Bible that we need to have discernment and wisdom. Um, he calls David and Jonathan told him all these things. In other words, he says, hey, you know, my dad, you know, I know he's, a, he's got a bad temper, but he doesn't want to kill you. So, so Jonathan brought David to Saul and he was in his presence at, as in times past. So uh, David actually starts eating and dining at Saul's table, as in times past. Verse 8, And there was a war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow, and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and Saul was, uh, rather, and David was playing music with his hand. So uh, David still being used by Saul in this capacity as we saw in the previous chapter when this demonic spirit came against um, Saul, David would be used to sort of assuage with his musical ability. Um, David, truly a remarkable person. He's a man of war. He was also a poet and, and a musician. Verse 10, Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with a spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it on the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head and covered it with clothes. Now let's just pause for a moment as we do on Tuesday nights uh, as we go in depth into these verses. Uh, it does use the word image there. The, u the word is a teraphim, which is used elsewhere in the Old Testament um, 
for, uh, for the word idol or idols. This is singular here. Um, some people think that like Rachel, if you remember that when Rachel was fleeing Laban with Jacob, she actually took some of the gods. I believe it's the same word here, teraphim. Some, th- some people think that Michael had this kind of thing. Uh, I think a better, uh, a better translation here is that, yes, the teraphim is used. Not always does it necessarily have to be an idol. Um, keep in mind, this is a wealthy house. It's a royal house. And, uh, you know, you walk around royalty's house. There's a knight. Not a knight, but the armor of a knight that looks like a knight or whatever. Uh, wealthy people have these things. And uh, I think, uh, considering where David is spiritually at this time, um, it's almost unthinkable that he would have... Uh, he has his faults, but uh, uh, not having teraphim in his house uh, of that size. But anyway, she takes a, a, a the statue or whatever of, of a man and puts it in the bed, tries to imitate uh, David. David has escaped through a window. Uh, puts a cover of goat hair. Verse 14 says, So when Paul... So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said he's sick. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. And when the messengers had come in, there was, an, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? So Michael lies here um, and says, David said he was going to um, kill me if I didn't lie for him. Of course, that was a lie. Uh, you know, she, she, she's fearful. She knows what her dad is made up of here. Um, she has some serious character issues uh, like her father, there's going to be a decline. We'll see that later. But uh, verse 18, so David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him, Samuel, all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. And so by this time, even Samuel uh, is concerned about his own life. I mean, Saul's a madman now. Samuel, the prophet, knows that. They go to some other city. Um, what happens next, I, I think, is, is very encouraging. Uh, he, he, David, in, in the remainder of the chapter, um, this is going to be very encouraging, I hope, um, for you. Verse 19, Now it was told Saul, saying, Take note, David is at Naoth in Ramah, then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of, saw the group of prophets prophesying and, and Samuel standing as leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. So what had happened here is uh, Samuel doesn't uh, retire and sit by a pool and play golf every day. Um, you know, if, if you're retired and you're listening to this and... And that's all you're doing. Um, I, I would direct you to this passage that um, in retirement, the Lord expects a lot more from you. Now, if you're playing golf and, and witnessing to the, the, the folks you're, you're with and serving at your church, praise the Lord. That's, you should be serving the Lord until you die. But um, uh, uh, here, in his... Re- in what at an age where many others retire and um, uh, they sit by a beach and, and, and enjoy uh, the golden years, no such thing as doing that outside of serving the Lord. But uh, instead of doing that, Samuel actually has a school of prophets. Now we'll see this uh, more in First and Second Kings with Elijah and Elisha. They, 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 there would actually be a school, kind of like a school of ministry. Love to get that started up in Boston someday, or or even a Bible school where they're training young men um, with the gifting, uh, the prophetic gifting. And uh, who knows, there may have been uh, women as well. Uh, men and women are prophets in the Old and the New Testament. And they're training them. And so the people who had been sent by Saul to assassinate uh, David come upon this meeting. Samuel's overseeing the meeting. And what happens? Instead of killing David... They start to prophesy themselves. Now this was, 
The Spirit of God came upon them. Doesn't mean they're Christians. Doesn't mean they're redeemed. Doesn't mean they're in, they'll be in heaven when you see them someday. God came upon a, a Balaam, who's a very, very wicked man, an incredibly wicked man, almost, uh, profe- uh, almost proverbially in the Bible is Balaam, uh, in the book of Numbers, wicked, but this, uh, God, God's Spirit came upon him and he prophesied. And so very unusual thing. I would love to know what they were prophesying. Might they have been prophesying uh, about David being king someday? Um, I don't know. Verse 21, and then Saul was told he sent other messengers and they prophesied likewise. Uh, then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. So Saul keeps on sending a different group of people to kill David. They keep on showing up. They, the Spirit of God comes upon them. Um, and then in verse 22, it says, Saul decides that he's going to go. You know, what? none of these guys can do this. Oh, it's always got to be me. So he goes to Ramah and came to the great well that is at Seku. And so he asked, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they are, are, are they not at Naoth in Ramah? And so he went there to Naoth in Ramah, and then the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And, and he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? And so, what in the world is all this about? Why is ink dedicated to this very unusual story? Well, um, I think we'll, there's a great lesson for us and a great encouragement for us, not only here in chapter 19, 19 but also in chapter 20, um, where David now, he's on his own. He, verse 18, he's fled, he's escaped, and he, everyone is against him now in, in his own mind. I'm, uh, you know, I think he believes, he, he knows that Jonathan's on his side. Um, everyone else has turned against him. He's by himself. Uh, and, and what does he do? He seeks out godly counsel. He goes to Samuel. He's probably doubting his calling at this time. You know, God will... God will call us to do something, but believe you me, uh, with the spiritual warfare for any man or woman who's been called by God to do anything, Satan's going to come in and lie and lie and lie and lie. And so he's not in a good place here mentally, uh, and you'll see that much more in the next chapter. Um, and so what, is, what does the Lord do? First of all, there's a lesson here, uh, seeking godly counsel. <laughs> you know, when you're freaking out, don't isolate yourself. By faith, even though every molecule in, in your body is saying, don't, no, don't do that, call a man or woman of God. Please do that. That's what David does here. In spite of the fact that he's, he's fearful, we'll see that in the next chapter. Um, and then what does God do? He just does this amazing thing where he shows David clearly, supernaturally, you see, you're on the right path. These bad things are happening to you. It has nothing to do with the fact that I, you're not still called. I'm preparing you. And just to prove it to you, I'm going to show you. And th- this just amazing things here uh, start to, to happen. That they're in this room and, and David sees these assassins come in to kill him. And all of a sudden they're prophesying. And then it happens again. And then it happens again. And then his adversary, Saul, comes in. And Saul's utterly humiliated. He strips off all his clothes. Now some people think, oh, he's still at a loincloth. I, I don't think that's what happened at all. I think God was showing David, this is what I do to your enemies. Don't be fearful. Uh, as, as First Peter says, and, and it's a good, good verse for us today, gird up the loins of your mind and take courage. Because we're in a we're in a time, brothers and sisters. We need to take courage in the call of God on our lives, and 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 he and Saul, Saul is humiliated uh, before him, and and no doubt David sees, wow, 
the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is upon us. And, and you know, the more years you walk surrendered uh, with the Lord, and if you're not surrendered, please start now. You will have, over time, just a series of clear markings where God just supernaturally just came in and so clearly, clearly worked in your life. I, I remember when Steffi and I were first called up to, 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 to Boston from Miami, um, and I say first called to Boston, I had been called six weeks earlier when I was in another state, but not, not six weeks, but six years earlier when I was in another state, state but the Lord just shut all the doors, so I put it on the shelf. But he began to call again um, when I was in Miami. And um, he said, you know, go back, go return, return to your birthplace. Go back there and, and wait on me for, to, to begin a church up there. It was an incredibly, incredibly difficult thing um, to do. Because um, although I had some relatives up here, I didn't know them very well um, at all. Uh, and... Um, it was like moving to a foreign country. I'd been gone away from for 25 years. Um, we'd come here summers, but 25 years and moving into Boston, I had visit. I had gone to Red Sox games, but that's about as much um, I, as I knew Boston when I was a kid. And so, um, but the way that the Lord just, I in times of fear and trepidation, just showed me really, really, really clearly, and the. And, and I have just a long, long story about that. But I, I remember uh, I got hired by, by I, I sent up a, my resume, a zillion resume. I, only, I got one offer from one company. It's the best possible place I ever could have worked, which eventually they let me go down to three days a week, uh, making actually eventually more money than I did for five days. It, th there was just the flexibility uh, there. Um, and I needed to work three days to be in the ministry. But my, the woman who hired me uh, initially when I came up from Miami, after I got up, she told me what happened. Um, a couple things about my hiring. One was um, uh, because of the salary that I made at the time in the Miami, they had a policy of never hiring anyone unless they could give you a, uh, some kind of increase in your salary. The problem is, is that all the peers at the company that they wanted to hire in, in me, the peer positions, there was about eight or nine other people who had the same position I was interviewing for. Um, they all made, they didn't make enough money for that grade level um, to, in, in order to hire me. And so the decision she told me later was actually made in order to hire me. Every single other person got a promotion in order to hire me. They were bumped up to a different grade level. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> and and uh, um, as well, the human resources uh, person who very, very powerful in, in Fortune 500 companies was adamantly opposed to uh, my hiring. And then just one day, she got transferred to a, a, a different place in the company and she was gone and the opposition uh, left and, and and I was hired, but I got to tell you, as hard as it was, uh, for the the initial year or two being up here, and it was really hard. When I heard that, when I heard that, that that's like the mo one of the most ridiculous stories I ever heard in my life. Like everyone else getting a promotion on their grade level because they hired it. It really what it did. It built up my faith, and the Lord just telling me, you see, I called you up here. Now hold your horses. I know nothing's going on because nothing, very, very little went on the, you know, the first a few years. But um, in, in terms of, you know, the church growing or a Bible study and, and, and this type of Bible study growing and this type of thing. But the Lord just uh, taught, uh, showed me early on when I was up, up here, you know, not wondering, is this really the Lord? Clearly. And the Lord will do that with you. He will, he will show you um, a after he has called you um, to, to serve him in whatever capacity, he, he, will, he will intervene supernaturally in those times of discouragement. A and he will, he will show you, and after a while, a testimony of your life is, is, is being written. A book, 
um, of your life is being written where there are markers, supernatural markers, that just mark the Lord uh, coming in at moments, sometimes critical, sometimes they're not critical at all. Sometimes you're doing real well and he just comes in and thud some great work of God in front of you and that just encourages you to move on. We have a faithful God, Calvary Chapel. And in and, and, and this time um, that we're in with this coronavirus outbreak, I tell you, I, I, I have been crying out to the Lord, Lord, we need to see your hand. We need to see your hand in the midst of this. Uh, Lord. And, and um, we can take some time to do that um, uh, tonight in the prayer time. Um, but it had to be an incredible, uh, incredibly, uh, uh, an incredibly uh, encouraging thing to, uh, to David to see this, to, to see these assassins all of a sudden being taken over by the Spirit of God and then even Saul himself um, humiliated in this way. Um, is, is the way that um, I, I interpret it and see it there. Chapter 20. Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And so he, he's still struggling now. He's still struggling mentally and emotionally um, here. And, and God, you will see, is going to encourage him again here. So Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without first telling me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. So again, Jonathan, I, I tell you, I would love to know this guy. I don't know if heaven's going to be this place where we get to go and hang out with people. And, uh, you know, I'd, I... I've always said the first thing person I'd like person I'd like to see is um, is Johann Sebastian Bach because I didn't grow up in a Christian family but they played Bach who was a Christian um, composer since the time I was two or three and and when you listen to Bach you're like oh yes that guy has the anointing of the Lord on it I just w I want to thank him someday I don't know if we're going to be doing stuff like that but but here uh, Jonathan he's 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 such a a good-hearted guy. He, he, he actually, um, it's to the point where he lacks some discernment. And, and, you know, this is the case, by the way, that sometimes uh, some of you in the natural, you're, you're just, you just so look on the brighter side of things, you're not listening sometimes when the Lord says, hey, wait, I'm trying to check your spirit. What you're seeing, I, I know you're an optimist. I know you like to see the best in everyone. But right now, um, y you need to be looking at this person a little differently. And that's why we always have to be in prayer. Last Sunday's, Sunday morning's message, uh, pray at all times. We need to be in prayer about everything. Uh, and so Jonathan here, lacking some discernment. Now my dad really doesn't want to kill you. You would tell him if he did. And verse 3, then uh, David took an oath again and said, your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. So David does have discernment now. He's fearing now in probably a way um, that's working against him. He's human, but uh, he's got, he knows what's going on now. Uh, D David, uh, a, a profoundly spiritual man already. Remember, he's, uh, he's gotten the anoint, anointing of the Spirit of God from uh, Samuel. He knows uh, what Saul is up to. Verse 4, So Jonathan said to David, Whatever you desire, I will do it for you. And David said to Jonathan, Indeed, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat, but let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. So there was a feast. You can actually see a reference to it in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10, um, that happened at, at the beginning of every month, and it was a feast to the Lord. But as many, many feasts happened throughout history, including Christmas, including Easter, uh, what, what started as something, um, uh, what started at some point, because I know uh, Christmas had pagan 
origins before it, but Christians took it over. And what started at some point uh, as being something for the Lord it turns into something different, and that's what it's uh, become here. It's just r- more of a, just a regular feast to, to chow down, apparently. Um, verse 6 says, If your father misses me at all, so David says to Jonathan, Look, you guys are going to eat. You're going to sit down to dinner. And I'm supposed to be at that dinner. And I'm not going to be at that dinner. And verse 6 says, So if he misses me at all during that dinner, say this. David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he says thus, it is well, your servant will be safe. But if he is very angry, be sure that evil is determined by him. So David here asks Jonathan to lie. Uh, Now more about this in a little, but it's showing what this mighty man of God in chapter 17, who takes on a, a Philistine and the whole Philistine armor, filled with faith, his faith is faltering. Uh, you know, you don't. When, whenever you resort to lying, you're not trusting in the Lord. Uh, God's not big enough, so I got to help out God to lie. And so, the Lord didn't need David to do this. But the wonderful thing about this book, <laughs> it doesn't keep back these flaws about the uh, the mighty men and women in the Bible. And so uh, he he's he's asking Jonathan. Uh, to lie here. Verse 8 says, Therefore you shall deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant with the Lord uh, with you. Nevertheless, if there is iniquity in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? So David is, he's kind of freaking out here. He, he's acting irrationally. He's, he, he's, ta- he's talking to David. Hey, I mean, rather, David's talking to Jonathan. Look, if there's anything wrong with me, you kill me now. And 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 uh, he he's reminding Jonathan here that look, you and I, you and I entered into a covenant, so you have to deal kindly with me. He's not even trusting Jonathan fully here, so he's he's in a bad way. Verse nine. But Jonathan said, "Far be it from you." So he's going to bring David back to reality here. He's going to exhort him. For if I knew certainly that evil was determined by my father to come upon you, then would I not tell you? Then Jonathan said to jo- then David said to Jonathan, Who will tell me, or what if your father answers you roughly? And Jonathan said to David, and he's going to come up with a little plan here. Come, let us go out into the field. So both of them went out into the field. Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord God of Israel is witness when I have sounded out my father sometime tomorrow or the third day, and indeed there is good towards David, and I do not send to you and tell you, may the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. But if it pleases my father to do you evil, then I will report it to you and send you away that you may go in safety. And the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And this is significant, verse 14. And this is Jonathan talking to David. And you, David, shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I still live, that I may not die, but you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. And so what he says to David here, he's more or less telling him there in verses 14 and 15, Listen, when you defeat all your enemies, including my father, please be kind to me, and also to my children and their descendants. And so, what he's doing here, he's giving him a powerful, prophetic 
encouragement to him. David doubting his calling there, the time where Samuel anointed David with oil, but that's a distant memory. He's, ter- he's, he's terrified. He's very fearful now. And, uh, and so he, uh, Jonathan uh, comes in here and encourages him. And even though Jonathan is the heir to the throne, Jonathan is, is more or less telling him, look, you're God's anointed. And so when you take over and when you're anointed, please deal kindly with my descendants. Such an important gift in the body of Christ, the gift of exhortation and encouragement. You know, we're in Romans chapter 12, and I didn't spend a whole lot of time um, with it when in Romans 12 on Sunday mornings. But one of the gifts of the Spirit, one of the spiritual gifts, one of the exhortations that Paul gives to the Romans when he says, present your bodies as living sacrifice, he's saying, and one of the things you do when you're presenting your bodies as living sacrifice is, if you have the gift of encouragement, you need to go do it. Chapter 12, verse 8. He who exhorts in exhortation. In other words, you... Don't hide this gift if you have this gift of exhortation. You use it. Use it with the people. And, and David here is just being tremendously encouraged. You can imagine where he's at here. Uh, and just to have the encouragement of a person. Now, he's already seen the hand of God with the uh, Spirit of God coming on his, the people. who are supposed to kill him. They start prophesying. Here he has the heir to the throne just encouraging him. And uh, so important if you have that gift of encouragement. And I've I've mentioned it before. You know, Steffi and I, oh, do we need people with that gift in our church. And we're so appreciative of you all who have that gift and who encourage and exhort us um, in, in our ministry. But not only, please, not only us, the, the servants of God, all the servants of Calvary Chapel, need exhortation. They, they need you to exhort. And, and uh, I was just in prayer today and thinking uh, that I need to get together with, um, w- w- with, with Matt Conan and, and maybe a couple of other of you and, we, uh, and just think of the people who we haven't really heard from and just to text them or call them and just let them know, uh, encourage them, just let them know uh, during this time of coronavirus um, outbreak. But, you know, what, one of the things that is so important that we, we learn here is here's this mighty man of God, David. I mean, can you imagine this guy? I, it, it, who, it, you know, it, in chapter 17, David says to the people who are around him regarding Goliath, who for 40 days has been... Um, taunting Israel, he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Who is this guy? And then, and then David to Goliath himself says, you come to me with sword and spear and with a javelin, but I come to you within the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And he's almost unrecognizable in chapter 20. He's not even fully trusting Jonathan. He's fearing for his life. You know, I, uh, I fear for, for when I hear folks start boasting about, you know, there's boasting in the spirit. There's bo- when Paul says, I just boast, in, when I boast, I boast on the cross. But I fear whenever I hear Christians, and from time to time I do, you know, I don't have, I don't have any fear about any of this coronavirus thing. I'm, you know, God is my... Uh, my God is my anchor, and whether I live or die, I'm the Lord. And, and, and this kind of uh, this kind of thing I hear from time to time, and and uh, I fear for them because of things like I'm reading now. You know, the Lord is bound to bring humble them for that kind of behavior. Praise the Lord if the Lord has you in that place, but please. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling and stay humble 
about it. You know, one of those verses in my prayer journal that I, I read all the time that I was talking about on Sunday is just that verse from Micah. It's just so rich. What does the Lord require of you except that you do justly, that you love mercy and walk humbly with your God? And if you encounter someone who's filled with fear, rather than saying, well, I'm not fearful at all, pray for them and have compassion on them. And here, here you know, uh, David is, um, he's in a bad, bad way. But this is why it's so important um, for us to uh, encourage people uh, and encourage people in the body of Christ and, and not hold back. I, I, I will also say this, you know, competition amongst um, Christians amongst pastors in particularly uh, it's just demonic and I, and I put my I, and why do I mention that well David here I, I mean Jonathan here yeah there's no competition between him and David he kno- in fact it's the opposite he knows David's going to be the next king even though Jonathan's the heir but you know revival's not going to come un- un- unless um, pastors and churches and denominations just put down the the spirit of oh you know they're growing and I'm not or what do I need to do to catch up with them just all of that I, I you know I'm constantly um, putting myself before the Lord expose that Lord because believe me I cut all that stuff but but but, but Lord you, please please Lord uh, uh, expose it in me uh, so I can just confess it to you. And he does expose it. And I do I confess it to him. And, and here, here's, this is what the Spirit of God is here. And in Galatians 5, I'm in Galatians 5 for my Bible study. And, and, and one of the things that um, it says, it, 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 and I mentioned this last week, is a work of the flesh is, is jealousies. But um, a work of the Spirit is just that kindness, that self-control, that love, that faithfulness towards people of every denomination who believes in the Word of God and declares uh, the Word of God. So, uh, verse 16 says, So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. In other words, we're going to have this feast. It's the same feast we have at the beginning of every month. Your chair is going to be empty, is what he's saying. Verse 19, and when you have stayed three days, go down quickly and come to the place where you hid on the day of the deed and remain by the stone of easel. So after three days not being at dinner, come to the forest near here is what Jonathan is telling David. Verse 20, Then I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target, and there I will send a lad saying, Go, find the arrows. If I expressly say to the lad, Look, the arrows are on this side of you. Get them and come. Then, as the Lord lives, there is safety for you and no harm. So if he, if he shoots the arrows not a long distance, He's got this uh, a servant of his, a, a boy who retrieves arrows for him. If the arrows come before the boy and Jonathan shouts out, hey, the, the arrows are closer to where I am, that means that's a signal to David that he's safe. Verse 22, but if I say thus to the young boy, look, the arrows are beyond you, Go your way, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter which you and I have spoken of, indeed the Lord is be between you and me. Verse 24, Then David hid in the field. And when the new moon had come, so so by the way, just brief pause there. This is how he's going to spend the next 10 years of his life, hiding in fields. You know, uh, just a confusing thing for a guy who used to eat at the king's table. Now he's hiding away in fields. A very, very difficult preparation period that God has for for David and and really for all of us, um, where God calls us into different ministries. And when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. Now the king sat on his seat, as at other times, on a seat by the wall. 
And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. Abner was the general of Saul. But David's place was empty. So David's not sitting at the meal. Nevertheless, Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, well, something has happened to him. He's unclean. Surely he's unclean. So, for example, touching a body, a dead body, would have made David unclean. David was a warrior. Um, if he's unclean, that he would have not been allowed into the presence of the king. That would have made other people unclean. Verse 27, And it happened the next day, the, the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, Why has the son of Jesse not come to eat, either yesterday or today? So David speaks up. Rather, Saul speaks up the second day that David's been absent. says, Why has David been absent? Except he's not using his name. He, he, he just has so many issues with um, David at this time that he, doesn't, he can't even bring himself to put his name upon his lips. When you get to the point where you have such issues with someone that you can't say their name, you've got to go to God, get on your knees, and repent. Because again, Luke chapter 6, verse 27 says, or maybe 37, God is kind to the unthankful and evil. We, we cannot, be, as much as Jesus died for us on the cross, we cannot have a place like that in our hearts towards anyone. Can't even say his name. Verse 27, why, why has the son of Jesse not come to eat? Verse 28, Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked permission for, of me to go to Bethlehem. And he said, please let me go for our family has a sacrifice in the city. And my brother's has, brother has commanded me to be there. And now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me get away and see my brothers. Therefore he has not come to the king's table. Verse 30, Saul's a wily guy, knows Jonathan is lying. It says J Saul's anger was aroused against Jonathan and he said, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? That's a reference to the day that uh, Jonathan was that Jonathan was conceived. Verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse, Jesse lives on earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Now therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. And Jonathan answered Saul's father and said to him, Why should he be killed? What has he done? I mean, there was a law of Moses with the Israelites. Uh, it wasn't like every other kingdom that may have existed at the time where the king doesn't like what, or how someone looks or looked at him that day and can just kill him. It's just not like that. This is the people of God. They're bound by the law of God. He couldn't just do something like this. Jonathan, he, he's a lover of God. He knows God. Why should he be killed? What has he done? Verse 33. Then Saul cast a spear at him to kill him, by which Jonathan knew that it was determined by his father to kill David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his, because his father had treated him shamefully. And so it was in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David, and a little lad was with him. So Jonathan knows that his dad wants to kill David, so he's going to do the, the little thing that, um, that he's going to... Uh, the little, pl the little plan that he had with David to let David know uh, that he was in trouble. Then he said to the lad, verse 36, Now run, find the arrows which I shot. As the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the lad had come to the place where the arrow was which, was which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried out after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan cried out after the lad, Make haste, hurry, do not delay. So Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came back to his master. 
But the lad did not know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew of the matter. Then Jonathan gave his weapon to the lad and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. And as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground, bowed, to get, bowed down three times, and they kissed one another, and they wept together. But David more so. So in many cultures, uh, where Pastor Greg and Jillian are, you, you not only kiss the women, you ki men kiss the men. It takes a little getting used to. Also in Arab cultures, that's what they're doing here. Verse 42, then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, May the Lord be between you and me, and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose, departed, and Jonathan went into the city. And so this is going to begin what scholars think is about a 10-year period of running away, living in fields, living in caves, living in rocks and crannies, and a very difficult, difficult preparation time. You know, some, sometimes, particularly men, look at leadership positions and they say, oh man, I'd love to be a leader like that. Or, so, or women too, actually. Oh, I'd like to be a leader like that. But then when they get into the position and, and are slaughtered by the spiritual warfare, uh, their second thoughts. And um, look, you need to go. If you've been called, you need to go. And uh, we'll support you. Um, but don't get any fantasies about what it's like to be in a leadership position. This is what it's like. So David here... Uh, rather, Jonathan here having to make a choice between his family and, uh, and really following the Lord. And it, it's heartbreaking to me sometimes where I see family um, refusing to do anything about it when it happens, when one of their family members is hurting someone in the body of Christ, but it's like they're somehow t interpreting things in their family's ways without just hearing the Spirit of God No. You, you don't love your family more than God. You need, to, uh, you need to follow the Lord. You need to correct your family member. You can't do that. And, and Jonathan here supporting uh, David, it's just um, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, picture of a man who's, who's dedicated uh, to the Lord. Uh, I do believe in a previous chapter that I said that... Um, you never see Jonathan uh, at any time. There's not, n nothing in the record that, uh, uh, in which he does anything wrong. <laughs> uh, he, he, um, he, does, he does lie to his dad. So we see his, his frailty there. I was wrong when I said that. But he's a tremendous, he's a, he's a tremendous man of God. And, uh, and so here, uh, this is going to be the beginning of a, a long and difficult uh, time uh, in David's life, which is going to end in, in chapter, I think, 31 at the, I think, 1 Samuel's 31 chapters. Um, but w there's just so much instruction there for us as, as David um, goes out and he lives like a fugitive and, and his faith being really, really built in the process, but, um, but definitely not perfect along the way. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus, thanking you for the word tonight. I pray, Father, that you would complete the work of prayer um, in complete, really, this sermon in, in the prayer time, Lord, as we intercede for our city and fight for it and encourage each other. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God bless you.